Good morning. Morning, everyone. Thank you. Welcome to church. Welcome to BRBC. If you'd like to get up on your feet and uh, we'll sing some worship to God together. Good morning, BRBC. Please take your seats. It's good to be together. Let's remember why it is we're together. So in Genesis chapter 2, it says, Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God finished his work that he had done. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. And we give thanks that since Christ's resurrection, the resurrected day was the day after the Sabbath day, which became the Lord's Day, and hence why we get to meet as we do each Sunday, the first day of the week, to look back on what's gone before, whether that was good or bad, and look forward to the week ahead. And so it's a good place to be gathered together. I'm Stuart, I'm one of the elders here and it's my privilege to welcome you to Bradfield and Ruffham Baptist Church and I'm just going to turn to another passage of scripture to remind us in whose name we come. Jesus says this in Matthew 11, come to me 
all who labour and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So I welcome you in Jesus' name. I welcome you to Jesus this morning. That if you're struggling with burdens and heavy weights from this past week, come and find rest. If you're full of the joy of the Lord, then we get to celebrate that together this morning. So how this morning is going to go, if you're new here, if you've never been part of us before, then I've just got a few announcements, a few need to knows. We'll then uh, hand over to James. We'll have what we call is our all-in slot, which is an opportunity to learn something all together. And this morning we'll be hearing something about our move to Thurston, which is coming up. We'll then have a time of sung worship before the children go out to their respective children's groups. We'll have time to pray together, time to open up God's word to hear what he's going to say to us as James brings God's word to us and opens it up to us. So... Let's move on to those morning announcements. There's just uh, three to get through this morning. And the first is Sunday mornings at Thurston. If you've been around here, you know we've been talking a lot about it. We're running out of space here at Bradfield and Ruffham. And so we're just going to move our Sunday morning services to Thurston Community College so that we can go back to one service. We can have the 11 o'clockers and the 9 o'clockers all back together in one place for one service at 10.30 a.m. And that starts next week. So don't turn up here. There won't be anyone here. We'll all be over at Thurston. Tonight, we have a vision and planning evening at 7 p.m. So again, in readiness for that first move, for that first service next week, how is it all going to function? How is it all going to work? So if you're involved, particularly in kids' ministries, a welcome team, Please uh, make every endeavour to come along this evening so that we can consider those things. But if you're not on either of those teams, it's important for you to come along as well. Be part of that. It's, it's a whole church family um, movement to go to Thurston. We'd love for you to come along, hear how it's all going to function, pray along with us so that we can be biblically and prayerfully dependent as we make this move to Thurston. And then next week we have Youth Jam. So if you are a youth then you can come along and play your instruments and have a time of fellowship with the other youngsters in the church and Glenn uh, and others leading you and have a time of fellowship and a time of worship and praise together. And one final announcement is connect cards. So most of you are already connected to the church in some way. Um, you receive the, the weekly emails but it may be that you're not yet on church suite and sometimes there's uh, other information that goes out on church suite. So again, in particular with this week, with the transition to Thurston, there will be some other key information that will come out via church suite. So if you're not on that, please fill out a connect card and ask to be included onto church suite um, and we can, we can make sure you receive those additional emails. But once again, if you're brand new here um, and you'd like to know more about what's going on at Bradford and Ruffin Baptist Church, Fill one out, pop it in the, uh, there's a post box at the back of the, the church. Fill it out and we can make sure that you are kept in the loop. So I'm now going to hand over to Joe, who has something to say. Excellent. Good morning, everyone. Good to see you all. So as uh, Stuart just said, next Sunday morning, we're going to be meeting at Thurston. It's going to be really exciting. Being back together as one church family, worshipping God together with space to invite new people in. I know lots of you have questions. How is it all going to work? How do I get into the building? How is the actual structure going to work? Maybe you're in one of the kids groups or the uh, in teen searches. You're like, how is that going to work? Where do we go for that? How is that all fitting together? Well, we've made a little video to help answer some of those questions. We had the opportunity to go into Thurston on Friday to do some setup and some prep work. So while we were there, we recorded a short video, which hopefully will let you know exactly where to go and how things will work. So we'll watch that now.
So we can use the car park, but we don't park out on the road. You can come in here with me, you can park anywhere around here. There'll be lots of people around here directing you and telling you where you need to go. When you park the car, you then want to head towards Wexford Thurston Community College over there. So follow me. So this is the main entrance door where we'll come in. There'll be some welcome team who will give you a welcome car that way as you go. Keep following on. As you come up the stairs before you go into the main auditorium, this is the area where we'll come to do the kids check in. So if you've got kids in either the preschool, the primary school, or the secondary school groups, here we'll check them in. You get a little stick of stick on your kid. So then that works well when they go into the kids' groups after the set. Having checked the kids in, then everyone will come through into the main auditorium. And this is it. So this is where we'll do the first half of our service with everyone together, and then we'll have the normal mid-service break, and then afterwards the kids groups will go out, and then everyone else will stay in for the service. So. so it's now time for the mid-service break. What happens now? Well, this is when the different groups go off. So if you're in a primary school group, you meet in the middle, your leader will be there, and they'll take you out through this door on the right hand side. If you're in the secondary school group, you'll also come out of this door. So come follow me, I'll show you where you need to go. As we're passing them, here's where the toilets are, so we can all use them on a Sunday morning. Then this is the room where the teenagers will be meeting, so you can hang out here. Yeah. And as we're heading back, I'll just show you this room, which we also can stop, which is a space where if you've got kids in the first half of the service and they're struggling a little bit in the auditorium, you can bring that in here. It's also a place where breastfeeding mums can come and feed their baby if they're not going to that So if you are in the primary school group, where are you going to be going? Well, as I said, you meet in the middle and then the leads will take you out. Again, from the store, so let me show you that as well. So this is going to be your space. You have a nice place here with lots of activities going on in this part of the dining hall. But what about if you have kids in the preschool group? Where do you take them? Well, you're going to be coming out of this door on the left hand side, so come follow me. So the preschool group is going to be in this room behind me. As you can see, there's going to be a area specially signed off for um, some of the smaller ones, so kind of Toddlers are going to be in this little bit, and then everyone else is going to be here with lots of different other activities and things happening. So after mid-service break, there's going to be age-specific teaching in all of the rooms, like whether you're in here or in the secondary primary school or preschool groups. At the end of the service, the secondary school group are going to make their way back into the auditorium and can meet you with their parents in here. If you've got kids in either the preschool or the primary school groups, you can come and pick them up. So if you come follow me, we'll show you where that is. So at the front of the age, you'll pick up here, and the kids can come through here. And very simply, you can pick up your kids from the preschool group from this room as well. For everyone else, there's going to be tea and coffee served from the hatches here. So this can be a big space where we can, after that, mingle around, have some really good time chatting to each other. And, um, and then go from there. Great. I must say, it takes a lot of practice walking that quickly. So um, if you need any tips, let me know. But I hope, on the serious note, that answers lots of your questions. I know you might have lots more questions. There's going to be opportunities for more answers to those this evening at the Planning and Vision Night. And then there's going to be a big email coming out tomorrow with a whole load more questions and answers on as well. But I know for all of us, the move to Thurston maybe comes with some mixed feelings. We love our space here. It's going to feel weird not being here on a Sunday morning. And I think if there are times that we do feel a bit uncomfortable or a bit sad, that's okay. It's only natural. But when we do think that and we feel that, I think there's two things we need to remember. The first is the why we're doing this. It's not because we want more comfort or ease. No, it's because we feel driven by the gospel. It's because we've seen the love of God poured to us. And we know there are thousands of people in our area that don't know Jesus Maybe that's our school friends, our neighbours, our family members, our friends, our colleagues. 
And so we so want to have space to be able to invite them into this community for other people to come in and hear this good news too. So let's never lose sight of that. But the second thing we need to remember is that we are a team. We want to do everything we can to make our Sunday mornings feel as welcoming as they can, to feel like a family, to feel like a genuine, tight-knit community where we can come together, where we can praise God, where we can learn from his, Bible, from his word, where we can draw near to Jesus and find hope and healing and strength and peace and love. But we need to do that together. We can set up as many structures as we like, but in, unless we're doing it together, unless we're working on this as a team, it's never going to work. So let's keep on going in that. Let's keep looking out for those lonely people or new people. Let's keep on loving our church family sacrificially. Let's keep encouraging and spurring each other on. It's down to each one of us, of course, through God and his Holy Spirit. And it's such a beautiful thing when that teamwork comes together. Because the Bible is clear that something of the unity and the love within God himself is expressed in his people and when we love each other. So let's go excited, yeah, maybe a bit nervous, a little bit dubious, but excited at what God might do through his people here as we seek to help other people hear about Jesus and keep on growing in love together as a church family. Back over to Stewie. Thanks ever so much, Joe. So just before we move to a time of uh, sung worship, let's just um, come before our Heavenly Father in prayer, shall we just briefly. Father God, we just thank you for the return of your day. Thank you that you, in your uh, infinite wisdom, gave us this one day of rest in a week so that we would come back to you, that we would refocus, we'd recalibrate ourselves back towards you, that we would have our hearts and minds directed back to you. Thank you for the welcome that we have in Jesus that, Lord, we do carry heavy burdens throughout the week, but we get to lay them all before you, that we get to bring them to you, and you have promised that you will bring us rest, and we look forward to that. And, Lord, as we consider our move to Thurston next week, um, though there is discomfort, though there are burdens to carry in that journey, Lord, we thank you that you go with us, you go before us in all things, and we just ask that you would be with us and bless us as a church as we move uh, to that new venture next week. So bless the remainder of our time together, Lord, and as we turn to you uh, in sung worship, may you receive uh, all of our praise, all the glory and honour that is worthy of you. Amen. So we've got three songs we're going to sing now. The first is uh, Christ Be All Around Me, the second is Hosanna, and the third will be Great Are You, Lord. Now, the second song, Hosanna, we, get, we sing that and we can get carried away with saying it without really knowing what it means. What does Hosanna mean? Well, in the Bible, we can find two, two different meanings. The first can be, it's, it's a plea. It's a plea to God for help. Save me, God. Intervene here. Help me. Perhaps you've had difficulties this week and you've questioned where God has been at that. And so that, that has been your cry this week. And maybe today, even, you're carrying those burdens so you'll sing Hosanna as a plea to your God. But the second meaning can be a thank you. Thank you for what you have done, God, at Calvary. Thank you for sending your son to rescue me. And we find ourselves often in one of those two places right throughout our lives, don't we? That we cry out to God for help or thanking him for what he has done. So let's bear that in mind as we turn to our song worship now and I'll hand over to the band. Thank you, guys.
Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Lord God, we thank you that you give breath in our lungs, that we are completely dependent on you for every moment, for every day, for every breath we take. Father, we pray that our praise this morning, from beginning to end, be pleasing and acceptable to you, a pleasing aroma to you. Until such time as you come again, we glorify you and worship you. So it's time for our mid-morning break now. Uh, if you've got children with you, they can go off to their respective uh, groups and please have a chat to the person next to you. Okay, we'll try and try and move things on a bit, draw those conversations to a, a pause until uh, coffee in a little while. So we're a church that uh, wants to encourage people to give to the life and work uh, of the church here at BLBC. We want you to give joyfully, generously and sacrificially. Um, if you call BLBC your home church, and you don't yet give regularly to us and feel that that is something you, you're able to do and you're feeling led to do, then uh, you can find out ways of giving through our website uh, and also through uh, Church Suite. And there's also a, a pay point out, out the back as well if you want to give a one-off donation. But if you're visiting amongst us, please don't feel any obligation to, to give us your money. We're just so pleased that you can be here amongst us as part of our fellowship. So now we're going to turn to a time of prayer because we believe... It's such a vital part of church life, and so it's my privilege to be able to um, lead you in prayer this morning. But please don't feel obliged to, to follow along with, with my sometimes garbled uh, prayer life. 
If you have places that you want to go in your own time of prayer, then use this time now to, to engage with your God. He hears you unconditionally because of the work of Jesus. And so if you've never prayed before, then I encourage you to do so. We've got a lot going on uh, in our world, in our church, and so it's good that we have time to bring that, those uh, concerns and requests to our God. But in the light of James's uh, message to us last week, uh, when we're considering how it is that we pray, we remind ourselves that we don't want to pray as the hypocrites do, full of self-pride and full of everything about us. We empty ourselves in humility when we look at the holiness of God and our unworthiness. We also don't want to pray as the Gentiles do, with empty words and phrases. We don't want to have vain repetition in the words that we say. But quite simply, we get to come as a child comes to their father, our Abba Father, we learn in Scripture. And so it's in that vein that we come to prayer this morning. So will you bow your heads and your hearts with me as we pray through some of the things uh, going on in our world right now. Abba, Father. As we say those words, as I say them audibly, as we as a fellowship say them in our hearts, it's by your spirit that we are enabled to say them. We say them not because of anything in us, because we are so utterly unworthy to call you Father. That you are holy and we are sinful. That, Lord, there is nothing in us worthy. There's nothing in us that, that should uh, cause you, holy God, to look down upon us and to hear us, to take any notice of us. But because we are, are adopted into your family through the precious blood of Jesus, we are adopted as sons and daughters, heirs and joint heirs with Christ. What an immense privilege we have to be able to bring our prayers and requests to you this morning. Lord, we know that each of us carries certain burdens, certain cares and concerns over the past week, the past months, the past years, perhaps years and years ago, we carry those burdens still. But Lord, we bring them to you now and we thank you that we have that opportunity. We thank you that we get to lay them before you. We thank you that we get to find rest at the foot of the cross of Jesus because of all that he has done. Lord, we know there have been those in our fellowship this week who have laid to rest loved ones. We know that there are those who are bereaved and grieved through the loss of loved ones and we pray for them, that you would be their comfort and their strength in their loss. That, Lord, your word commands us that there will be a resurrection day for each and every one of us who is trusting in the Lord Jesus for their salvation. And so that gives us great hope a great excitement for the future when those relationships will be renewed and refreshed anew in that heavenly eternal rest. Lord, we know that there have been those this week who have suffered sickness, who have suffered uh, concern over their health. There have been unexpected hospital appointments and visits to A&E. We know that there are ongoing health concerns and struggles in the life of our church, mental health, physical health. Lord, we bring those people before, uh, up to you. We lift them before you, their, their cares and their concerns, that, Lord, yes, we look to our health service. Yes, we look to our doctors and the experts in those fields. We thank you for them. Thank you for giving them to us and that we have access to those. But, Lord, we bring all of our cares and concerns to you, knowing that you are the one who truly heals. And so we pray for healing and restoration for those who are struggling in our fellowship this week. Lord, we know that there are so many other cares and concerns that we might carry, relational concerns, financial concerns, anxiety and depression, all manner of concerns. But Lord, here we find rest in you. And may we sit and be still at your feet this morning. Lord, we know that our world is raging with concern and hatred. That even last night we know that uh, missiles are being flung across the globe, Lord, in acts of war, in acts of terror. We thank you that 
by your grace, so many of those missiles were intercepted. We thank you that those drones were brought down and thank you that the loss of life was, was next to nothing. Lord, we thank and praise you for that. But Lord, we know that irrespective of, of that, there are other conflicts going on. There are other uh, difficulties and strifes going on in our world, particularly in Israel against Hamas and all that's going on there for the hostages still in captivity. Lord, we pray for their release. We pray for peace in that region amongst your people. And we know that, that none of these conflicts will come to an end unless people turn to Jesus. Unless people turn and see the sin in their own hearts and see their own need of salvation, see their own need of a saviour. We look forward to that day, Lord, when you will come again and you will come in power and peace will truly reign in the new heavens and the new earth. What a day that will be. But Lord, until that time, we thank you that uh, we have your word. We thank you that we have your spirit amongst us. We thank you that you give us church community where we can be a fellowship together. And Lord, as we uh, look ahead to our um, relocating to Thurston next week, go ahead of us in that that, Lord, we will once again be a collective body of your people here at BRBC, that we get to do life together, that we get to journey together. Thank you for the opportunities we have for fellowship and prayer and Bible study. Thank you for uh, relationships formed through this sense of community that we have here. And, Lord, may we see that multiplied, may we see it grow, and may you bless us in our endeavours in all that we do there. But, Lord... Uh, as we turn to our uh, remainder of our service this morning, we want to pray for your blessings be upon James as he opens up your word to us, as we consider what it is to, to take upon ourselves that, that position of prayer and fasting so that we might uh, have our hearts and our minds truly focused towards you and to what you would have us do. Lord, we know that beyond thirst and beyond there, we don't know what the answer is. We don't know where you're going to take us. But Lord, we, we, we seek your wisdom. We seek your spirit to come down and we seek for your guidance to be upon us as an eldership and as a church family that, Lord, you would lead us and guide us in future days. We do pray for the sake of your kingdom, for your glory and for your honour. We do pray these things. Amen. So if you turn with me now in, your, in God's word, if you have a Bible, please open it up, whether uh, an electronic Bible or uh, a book Bible, please turn with me to uh, Matthew chapter 9, and a short passage, verses 14 to 17, which will be on the screen behind me, but we love it if you have a Bible with you to get that open in front of you so that you can read along. So, Matthew chapter 9, verses 14. It says, Then the disciples of John came to him, saying, Why do we and the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? And Jesus said to them, Can the wedding guests mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast. No one puts a piece of untrunk cloth on an old garment, for the patch tears away from the garment, and a worse tear is made. Neither is new wine put into old wineskins. If it is, the skins burst, and the wine is spilled, and the skins are destroyed. But new wine is put into fresh wineskins, and so both are preserved. Now I hand over to James. Okay, this is the second part of our mini two-part series on prayer and fasting. And to really understand why we're taking time out to talk about these two things, we have to understand where we're at as a church family collectively. So we've already said this morning, this is our last kind of regular Sunday morning here in this building. We say time and time again, the church is not the building, it's the people, sure, but place is still important. So it's going to feel uncomfortable, uh, and maybe we're going to have to make an intentional effort to say, look, it's still us, and we'll make it work in God's strength, for sure. So we understand it's going to be different. We will come back here for the odd Sunday morning that we can't have Thurston for two all-age services at 9 and 11 back in this building. So it's not a goodbye Sunday mornings here. 
We will come back, but our norm will be changing. Now, we're not going to have Thurston High School for an indefinite amount of time. It's not really our long-term plan. They're going to be, at some point, we're here building a new school, so maybe a two-year window, by the looks of it, that we're going to have access to the school. So that means we're going to have to really start thinking, deliberating, and prayerfully seeking the Lord's guidance for what's next for us as a church. We're going to have to be pretty decisively thinking through what the long-term plan of the BRBC family is going to look like. But we've all been realizing more and more, and, and maybe you're in this as well, is that we, we could come up with all of the plans in the world, but it is totally and completely pointless if our hearts aren't attuned to the things of God. You know, we could go ahead and build a vision, but if it's not the Lord who builds it, we build in vain. We could come up with outlandish, elaborate strategies. We could make plans, but it's pointless. If we ourselves aren't broken for the things that break the heart of God, if our hearts aren't in tune with the absolute core of what the gospel is, if we don't come back to the first love of Jesus. So that's why two weeks after we've moved to Thurston, we're going to have a four-week chunk in the month of May devoted to prayer and fasting. We're going to collectively pray. There'll be a prayer guide produced each week for us where we have a passage of Scripture to read through each day. You can decide how you want to engage with that. Maybe it's you individually. Maybe it's your household together praying through those things. And what we're going to do is encourage you to think about how you can engage with that month of prayer through fasting as well. That will be down to you how you seek to engage with fasting in that month. But the whole idea of all of that is to say, look, God, we have lost sight of something important. We've lost sight of what's at the core of our faith. We have lost sight of some of the key things that we knew when we came to know Jesus from the beginning. We can be honest about that, can't we? I don't want to miss some of the good things that God has done and is doing in our church. Praise Him for that. But maybe we have lost sight of some important stuff. Maybe there are areas of church life and individually where we are lukewarm, where we've become calloused or we're numb or even cold to the things of God. I mean, how many times do we find ourselves saying, the goodness of Jesus, uh, Jesus satisfies, and yet we spend our weeks running into the things of this world thinking that that will satisfy Or how many times do we say, yeah, the holiness of Jesus is ours and we want to live holy lives? That's just lip service, though, isn't it? Because we even laugh at the stuff we know is sinful and that breaks God's heart. What about grace? We sing about amazing grace, and we say that to our souls, it is a sweet sound, and yet inside we remain unmoved by God's grace. And what about this idea that Suffolk needs Jesus? Oh, yeah, we know that. But then shrug our shoulders and say, that's someone else's problem to deal with. Oh, thank God for the amount of stuff going on. But in reality, before we make a step forward, we've got to look in the mirror and we've got to ask him to reshape us and show us what's true of us and true of him. Come come back to square one, if you will. Prayer and fasting is a way in which we as a church are going to come back to square one. So that's why last week we looked at prayer, kind of cleaned our glasses, if you will, to see what prayer is all about. So that provides a foundation for what's coming for us. And this week, what we're going to take a look at is that thing we always talk about, fasting. (laughs) No, I'm joking. We don't talk about this very often. Now, now let's do a little bit of a, a thought experiment, shall we, to start with this idea of fasting. What comes to your mind when I say the word fasting? I mean, just stop for a moment and think about what it is that bubbles up to the surface when you hear the word fasting. I wonder. I wonder if you might be thinking to yourself, James, I have no idea where to begin, because we don't talk about it ever, and I've never been in a church that has. Or maybe you're thinking, fasting, that's a bit dangerous, isn't it? Because I don't want to be a legalist. Or, Or maybe you're thinking, fasting, that's for the Catholics, isn't it? We don't do that. 
Or, or, or are, you, are you thinking stuff like, ah, oh, fasting, that's a good thing. J- James, I've been toying with going on a diet. I, I, I could do with fasting. Uh, lay it on thick this morning. I need that. Or, or maybe you're saying fasting. Um, isn't that that fad that's going around at the moment, the whole idea of intermittent fasting? But wasn't that for health reasons? What's that got to do with our spiritual lives? Maybe we find ourselves this morning not really knowing where to begin with fasting because it's something that we know is important, but we don't know what to do with it. I guess it's kind of like this. In in our homes, I'm pretty sure in every home there is a place where you put things that are small but important, but you don't know what to do with. Usually it's a drawer in a dresser in a hallway, right? There's some drawer somewhere, and you I don't know, it's like batteries that have like a little bit of charge left in them and you don't want to chuck them out, so they go in that drawer. And maybe it's a whole garage, I don't know. (laughs) Or or, or in that place you might find old hair clips or there's buttons that have popped off your jackets but you haven't had a chance to sew them back on. Or maybe there's an old compass from school and there's always pens that have run out in there for some reason, right? That's the place where you put stuff which you know are important and useful but you don't know what to do with. I guess what we're doing is opening that kind of mental or even spiritual draw this morning, taking out fasting and saying, look, we know it's important. We don't know what to do with it, so let's think about it. Let's think about the, the foundation, the basis, the concept, the practice of fasting. Now, what we're going to do is something of an overview today. There's a lot to work through to give us a basic understanding. Our special focus, we will see, is in Matthew 9, just as Stuart read. And in Matthew 9, I think it's probably the most important passage in the Bible on fasting. You have John disciples coming to Jesus with a question. Hey, Jesus, we as John disciples fast along with the Pharisees. Your disciples don't fast. What gives, Jesus? And then Jesus responds with what is seemingly or initially a cryptic answer with a whole bunch of images. Talks about himself being the bridegroom, unshrunken cloth, new wine in old wine skins. It, it seems like Jesus is being really confusing, but I think at root, Jesus is saying something simple about his arrival and what that means for fasting. So what we're going to do is dive into this idea of fasting to understand it. Now what I will say is there's a lot to work through. It's going to feel really broad because we are breaking, if you will, a silence on fasting. There's a lot to see here. I kind of think of it like this. I coach my boys' football team. And I'm able to do different things each week at training because they have a basic understanding of football. So I don't have to teach them the big game of football every week. It might be, hey, this week we're going to work on corners. So it's just a small element of the game because they already know it. What it feels like this morning is an introduction to what football even is. So that's why there's so much to cover and look at. So bear with me, but my hope is it equips us really well for now and then for May. So we're going to split this into four key parts for us this morning. It's going to go like this. A foundation, the gospel, number two. Number three, our reasons. And number four, the practice. So the foundation, what is it? So we'll build a definition of fasting. Number two, the gospel. How should we think about it as Christians? Should we be thinking about it differently? Number three, our reasons. What are the various circumstances that would cause us to engage with fasting? And number four, the practice. I want to give us some really small but important need to knows on how fasting can work. And then once we've done those four things, I'll give a final word for what May is going to look like for us. So let's dive into the first one, shall we? We're going to call this a foundation. What is fasting? Let's build a definition. Now, Matthew chapter 9, the first two verses, I think, are so fascinating. Then the disciples of John, it reads, came to him saying, Why do we and the Pharisees fast, but your disciples don't fast, Jesus? And Jesus responds to them, Can the wedding guests mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and they will fast. Now, there's a lot we can say about this passage, and there's a lot we will say, but first things first. There is an assumption within Jesus' response to their question that his people will engage with fasting after his post-resurrection departure. You see that there? After Jesus has died, Jesus has risen, and he's gone to be with his heavenly Father, the kind of thing he was preparing us for, there's the assumption that his people will fast. 
Okay, so what is it? I want to start building an idea by doing the quickest whistle-stop tour of fasting in the Bible. We're going to take a look at some Old Testament examples and some New Testament examples. So bear with me here. Here comes the tour. Let's take a look at the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, we have examples of both individuals and the whole nation engaged in fasting. The Day of Atonement was an important day out of the year for the nation of Israel, where the priest would go into the Holy of Holies and offer a sacrifice for the sins of the people. That would have been accompanied by national fasting. It was a sober, sombering, important day where they demonstrated and expressed their need for God. You read Zechariah chapter 8 and you find four more annual feasts are instituted for the nation, which shows us that fasting was a central aspect to religious life in the Old Testament. Then we have individuals who go about fasting in the Old Testament. King David fasted and wept, pleading for the life of his unwell child in 2 Samuel chapter 12. The Israelites fasted collectively, seeking God's guidance in Judges 20. And then fasting was used to express various heart attitudes, such as grief in 2 Samuel 1. Repentance in Daniel 9, humility in Ezra 8, or a longing for God's guidance and help in Ezra 8. What about the New Testament? Here's the whistle-stop tour. We begin early doors in the New Testament in Luke chapter 2 with that wonderful woman at the temple, Anna. Remember her, the prophetess? It, it, it tells us that we, she was constantly fasting and praying, bearing witness to everyone around her that the Messiah is on the way. Jesus begins his ministry with 40 days of fasting in the wilderness. But then within Jesus' teaching, he assumes that his people will fast after he's gone. Matthew chapter 6, Jesus provides instruction on fasting, saying don't go around fasting like the hypocrites who use fasting just to make themselves look super spiritual and holy to everyone else around them. Matthew chapter 9, there's the assumption that his disciples would fast once the bridegroom is gone. And then in the book of Acts and throughout the New Testament, we see fasting again, seeking God's guidance and empowerment. The leaders at Antioch were fasting in Acts chapter 13 when they commissioned Barnabas and Paul. Then in Acts 14, we see the elders are appointed but through prayer and fasting. And then the apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and chapter 11 talks about his own fastings, which demonstrates that fasting was a central aspect in his life and ministry. You can see it everywhere. Oh, thanks for the overview, James. You're still not giving a definition. Well, here we go. Fasting is abstaining from a good thing. Then feeling the want, the appetite, the longing, the draw towards that good thing, and then seeing that that physical experience is a window to what is spiritually true of us the whole time. Right? So, so it's an abstaining from a good thing. Usually food, but not always. We see in the Bible you can fast from food. You can fast from sex, we see in 1 Corinthians 7. So it's saying no to a good thing. That could even be screens or a type of food like sugar or alcohol, whatever. No to a good thing, stepping back from it, then feeling the draw, the longing, the desire, the ache for that thing, and then that physical experience becomes a window into what is constantly, deeply, spiritually true of us. Our souls are hungry for God. So here's an example. You might decide to fast from food. It might be a meal or two. You might want to go for 24 hours if you are able and don't have medical issues like that. You might want to step away from screens for a period of time. What's going to happen is you're going to feel the appetite for that thing. You're going to want it. You're going to feel the desire and the longing. But what happens in fasting is that space is then filled by a heightened or renewed awareness of your spiritual need of Jesus. Fasting shocks our hearts out of the illusion of self-sufficiency and re-clarifies our awareness that we need God more than we ever realized. We need Jesus. 
I'm going to give you four definitions, real simple ones, but I think they work together to build our understanding. This is from the Ligonier website. Fasting is an act of humility wherein we acknowledge our need to subdue the appetites of the flesh and focus more intently on who we are and what we've been given in Christ. Second one, Martin Lloyd-Jones. Fasting is the abstinence from anything that is legitimate in and of itself. So a good thing for some special spiritual purpose. John Piper, next one, I love this one. Fasting is, at its root, a, home, a, a hunger of a homesickness for God. Fasting is not only a spontaneous effect of our superior satisfaction in God, but a chosen weapon against every force in the world that would take away that satisfaction. And then finally, R.C. Sproul. I like this one. Fasting was intended by God to help us to recover or develop an appetite for the food that truly nourishes the Word of God. Fasting helps us feast on Christ. So fasting is a God-given, God-gifted tool that sharpens our awareness of our dependence and need of God. Fasting is saying no to the good thing, whatever that might be, and then recognizing that you have that need, that desire that wells up within you that shows you what is spiritually always true. Think of fasting like a knife sharpener. Now, earlier this week, it felt like health-wise, family was falling apart. Poor Quincy has got this nasty eye issue, which hopefully, prayerfully, she will recover from over the next few weeks. But what that meant was I had to do lots of extra little bits and pieces around the house. Now, you know, you know that when, when one of you goes down, you end up being really thankful for everything that they do. <laughs> That was me this week. Quince, you do so much. And there I'm trying to prepare a meal, so I'm ch trying to chop up some vegetables and then realize our knives have got really, really blunt. I don't know how they work. They're so just terrible. I mean, the, the blunt side of the knife is the same as the supposed to be sharp side of the knife. So I'm trying to go through an onion, but you know when it's so blunt, the skin of the onion seems to fold into the onion. It's like, oh, this needs sharpening. So I go to the drawer and take out the knife sharpener, which is just this, this kind of rough metal wand, if you, I don't know what they call it. And then what you do is you, 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 you rub, scrape the knife if, along it. If, you, if you're somebody who hates the sound of metal on metal, I'm sorry for the image. But you just, you, you, you run the knife along it, and then what happens, what was blunt then becomes sharp again. Think of fastening, fasting like that, 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 that knife sharpener. We are always in desperate need of God, but we become blunt and lack awareness of our ongoing need of Him. So fasting will sharpen our awareness and the acknowledgement of our need. That's why it goes hand in hand with prayer in the Bible. It's a tool to help us attune to see what's always true of us. Our souls are more hungry for God than we ever realized, and He is the one who satisfies the appetites of our soul. So to bring this down to earth so simply, Fasting aims to give us a physical window of what is deeply true of us spiritually. Going without something produces the want, which is a picture of our deepest need, Jesus. So fasting recognizes that we grow blunt. Fasting cultivates a deeper longing for God. Fasting shows us that Jesus satisfies. But how do we think about it as Christians? Number two the gospel. I'm going to reread the passage Stewie read out from Matthew 9 for us, and then we'll work our way through it as best as possible. So John's disciples come and ask the question, hey, we're fasting, they're fasting, your disciples don't. Jesus, why? Verse 15, and Jesus said to them, can the wedding guests mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away and they will fast. Here comes his images. No one puts a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old garment, for the patch tears away from the garment, and a worse tear is made. 17. Neither is new wine put into old wineskins. If it is, the wineskins burst, and the wine is spilled, and the skins are destroyed. But new wine is put into fresh wineskins, and so both are preserved. What is Jesus on about there? I, I want to help you see here what Jesus is getting at, what it means for us, and how Jesus makes things clear. 
What is Jesus getting at? Simply, he's saying this. Fasting is different because he's arrived. Fasting is different because the promised Messiah stepped into this world. So these disciples of John are asking the question, why no fasting of your disciples? Jesus' response is full of illustrations. He gives three illustrations, right? Bridegroom, the cloth, and the wineskins. But what I think is happening here is he's making two points because these two images go together. So let's look at them in categories. The first illustration, Jesus compares himself to a bridegroom and his disciples to wedding guests. Now, in Jewish culture, a wedding was a little bit different to the way we do weddings. It went on for days, sometimes for a week. And it was a time of great joy and celebration where the bridegroom and the bride and all of the wedding guests would be together. Those wedding celebrations would never be a place for mourning. You would never lament. It wasn't a place for being somber or or, or, or lamenting in any way. It was celebratory. It was full of joy. Jesus is saying, the bridegroom, referring to himself, I'm here. But my arrival, Jesus seems to be saying, has brought about a new era. But fasting is still going to be appropriate. It's still going to be needed. It's still going to happen when I am gone. And he is referencing his death and his departure. Okay, the second cluster of illustrations are twofold, right? Because we've got the old garments on unshrunk cloth, and we've got the new wine in old wineskins. What does that mean? Keep following me. Both examples are depicting this idea that Jesus is ushering in a new stage in history. It's a new covenant point in history. So the old ways of thinking, the old ways of doing religion weren't going to work anymore. Because the new unshrunk cloth will shrink if you put it with the old stuff. The new wine will burst the old rigid wineskins. Jesus is saying, here's a new thing happening, and it cannot be contained by the old. New wine requires fresh wineskins, so his ministry is bringing about something new. So you can see in his words, fasting still happens, but it's different now. What is he getting at? A couple things. The purpose of fasting is now reorientated. In the Old Testament, fasting was about mourning, repentance, expressing a need for God. But with Jesus' arrival, fasting has taken on a new tint, a new purpose. It expresses our longing and our aching for deeper intimacy with the bridegroom himself. He's present, and his kingdom is here, and we long for it in its fullness. Fasting realigns our hearts to prioritize Christ and his return above all else. We fast from a position of gospel confidence. Our fasting flows out of the reality that Jesus has won and we stand in his victory. But he is also saying that fasting remains valuable. Just like the Old Testament saints, we fast to humble ourselves before God, to cultivate a spiritual hunger, to align our desires with his. Fasting serves as the physical expression of our deep, continual need for Jesus and his spirit to move in us. So fasting is done in light of Jesus' victory. He has won and he will win. It's an expression of our desperate need of him and to see him more clearly. It's an expression of our longing for God to bring healing in this world and for his presence and his work in and through us. Okay, what does that mean for us? Well, connect the dots here. If fasting is about sharpening our awareness of what's spiritually true, then fasting is the recognition that we grow blunt like knives in our kitchen and that we need to be sharpened to the things of God. We're like slow leak tires and we grow flat to our need of God and his grace. Like a watering can with a dripping leak, we will become empty to the things that we knew when we first began our walk with Jesus. That's why fasting is good for us. We proclaim the goodness of Jesus, but we have no idea how good he is. We speak about amazing grace, but we need to see how amazing grace really is. 
Fasting shows us our need of God. We were in a desperate state without Jesus. Desperate, lost, deserving hell and judgment, left unsatisfied by the things of this world, but through Jesus we have everything we need. Fasting brings us back to the core truths that we began with. We spend our lives terrified of the world, and we need Jesus for strength. Fasting shows us that we need him, and he fills us with what we need to go. We lose sight of his power to move in this world. Fasting shows us we need him. We make rather outlandish statements on a Sunday morning about the nature of God, but we don't really live it out. Fasting shows us what's really true and what we really need. If you think about it, it makes sense why fasting and prayer goes together. Fasting is the physical sign of our wandering, weary hearts that Jesus satisfies and that he is enough. If you're a guitarist, when you finish playing your guitar, you're going to put it in the case. And after a day or two, you might go back to the guitar, and when you pull it out, one or two of the strings are going to be slightly out of tune. So you might clip that tuner onto the end of the guitar or put a tuner nearby, and you will play each string and retune that string. Our hearts are exactly like the strings on a guitar. Give it a few days, we are out of tune. We have wandered away from the truth of the gospel in ways we don't even know. Fasting shows us our need. It brings us back to square one. Fasting has a declaration that says, Lord, retune my heart to sing your praise. So if you think about it, fasting has an edge of repentance because it comes with this idea that we're weak. We're small. We're so messy and sinful. We need God. We grow lukewarm. But fasting also has an edge of faith because it says, God, you're the one who satisfies. Jesus is enough. And if anything good is going to happen through our church family in this world, then it's going to be in your strength because we need you. Now, if you think about what Jesus is saying in Matthew 9, it makes things clear for us. It means that fasting is never a badge for us to wear. Jesus tells the disciples that on the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 6. When you fast, don't be like the hypocrites. They've got their reward. They used fasting to be a spiritual badge so everyone can look at them and give them the high five. Man, you're holy. No, don't use it like that. It's not a badge. Jesus shows us that fasting doesn't add. Too many of us perhaps slip into this idea that fasting somehow contributes to God's grace in our lives. No, we have all that we need in Christ. We just need to see it. Colossians chapter 2, the Apostle Paul warns the Colossian church about exactly that. Don't go around thinking that Jesus isn't enough. Don't go around thinking that fasting will somehow make God love you more. No, fasting is to open your eyes to see that he does love you. And then fasting doesn't have a disinterested deity in view. It's not like God has given us fasting because he says, hey, I'm going to be at a distance. I'm going to be disinterested. So you're going to need something to get my attention for you to do what you want, for me to do what you want me to do. It doesn't. It has a loving heavenly father in view. Fasting in light of the gospel is beautiful. We don't do it to earn God's favor. We don't do it to leverage his hand in this world because he is reluctant to do anything. But it expresses our utter dependence on his grace and our longing for more of him. So Matthew 9, Jesus is saying, after his departure, after he's ascended to be with the heavenly father, people like us will experience an inner ache. We will long to know more of what he has done. We will long to know more of what he will do. And we'll long to see more of him satisfy us in the present. Fasting cultivates and demonstrates that longing. Number three are reasons. What are some of the reasons? Here's what I mean. What are some of the circumstances in our lives that would cause us to think about fasting? I'm going to give you five of the top reasons. First one, it's to deepen our relationship with God. So if fasting expresses a spiritual hunger, it's for more of God in our lives, to know him more. Have you ever found yourself asking the question, where did my spiritual passion go? You kind of look back (laughs) to the time you first came to know Jesus, like, whoa, whoa. I was so full of the joy of the Lord. Uh, That's not true of me now. 
Maybe you look back to those days and weeks after your baptism. You're like, that feels like a different person. What happened? I wonder if what happened is that you slipped into the illusion of self-sufficiency. You grew numb of your need of him. You lost sight of your dire, desperate need of grace. Christian joy always comes through knowing your need. The joy you have in Jesus is directly correlated with your understanding of your need of him. Fasting shows you that you need him. So ultimately, fasting propels you into the joy of Jesus. It's through fasting and prayer that we say, God, bring me back to the electrifying, joyful, joy-giving awareness of my need because Jesus looks great when I know my need of him. Number two, it's to overcome spiritual lethargy. Fasting can be an incredible tool that sharpens us and can propel a renewal or a reviving individually or collectively. Think about this. We, we say often that Suffolk needs Jesus. Great. But way too often inside we're unmoved, we shrug our shoulders, and we think it's someone else's job. Through fasting, we become attuned to our need and our county's need of Jesus. It's the physical sign of the spiritual reality we need to see. Now, often revivals have taken place in church history. And when it comes to revival, a lot of people think that revivals are just a lot of people coming to know Jesus. That's what it is, isn't it? No, no, that's a symptom of revival. It's an outflow, a knock-on effect. What revival is, is when Christians are suddenly snapped out of their spiritual lethargy and into an acute awareness of their desperate need of God. It's when repentance takes place. Oh God, how did I miss your grace like that? I needed you. I've become numb to the truth. And then flinging ourselves anew onto Jesus and collapsing into his grace. That's revival. And number two, it's to seek spiritual wisdom and clarity. We see lots of examples of this in the Bible. Acts chapter 13. They worship the Lord and they fast that they would discern his will. Number four is to petition for specific needs or burdens or needs. We can fast for specific examples, uh, crises, needs, whether that's physical, emotional, or spiritual. And then finally, it's to express godly grief and repentance. We see this all over the Bible. Definitely in the Old Testament, it's everywhere. Where we see God's people coming to the place where they recognize we have fallen sinfully short. We need Jesus. John Calvin writes in his Institutes, a holy and lawful fast. We use it either to mortify or subdue the flesh, to prepare for better prayer and holy meditation, or to give evidence of our humbling, our humbling ourselves before God when we would confess our guilt before him. Each of these reasons is a gracious invitation from God to reorientate our wandering hearts to the superior spiritual nourishment of Jesus and his kingdom. We feel the pangs in our body, but that shows us what's deeply spiritually true. Number four, our practice. What does it look like? Well, the Bible's not very prescriptive on what it should look like for us. And think about it. Fasting is diverse in type. Now, for most people, you go without food for a period of time. That might be 24 hours, it might be just a meal or two, depending, medically speaking, what you're able to do. But fasting in 1 Corinthians can be where couples say, we're going to step back from sex for a few days in order to seek the Lord. Maybe it's fasting from phones or screens, a type of food, sugar or alcohol. It's fasting from something good that God has given to reawaken our spiritual lives to the truth that's always there. Fasting can be different in context. Sometimes it can be done privately. No one else knows about it. Jesus says that in Matthew 6. But then we find examples of it done corporately and collectively, which will be true of us as a church. Fasting is open-ended in time. 
The Bible doesn't say how long it should last for or what the duration is. The length of the fast is often determined by the specific circumstances or the people. And it's varied in practice. I know some people who have fasting as a regular thing that happens weekly in their lives. I know other people who say, I'm just going to wait when the specific needs arise and I will respond with prayer and fasting when they come, when that comes. So that's the basis for fasting. Hopefully gives us a idea of how this works. So a final word for us. I encourage you to integrate fasting as a practice in your life. My study this week has been really good for me to re-engage with this. I hope this is helpful for you. But what about the month of May for us? Prayer and fasting. It will be a collective approach. A prayer guide will be produced for all of us that we can walk through every day. You can use that prayer guide in your home personally or as a household or maybe even decide as a community group you might follow that. There will also be opportunities for collective prayer beyond the Sunday mornings, the community groups, beyond prayer night, We're going to open up spaces where you can come and pray throughout different points in the week to come and seek the Lord and ask for him to show us what we have missed. Now, what we're not going to do is tell you what to fast from. I want some of you to be really careful because I think sometimes people get excited and it becomes a little bit unsafe, especially if you have a medical issue. That means you shouldn't be doing this. Think really wisely about this. It's a personal decision, and you're going to have to think about how you will engage with fasting throughout May. That's over to you. There may well be particular days where we as a church fast together, and you can think about how you can engage on those days. Now, the prayer guide is going to be more prescriptive. That's a little bit easier to do. We can lay out a plan, but we won't lay out a plan for fasting. That is going to be different to each person, Given your diverse circumstances in your life, the prayer will be collective and planned out, but fasting will come down to you to figure out how you want to go about that. But why are we doing this? To overcome spiritual lethargy. To say we've got lukewarm and calloused. Suffolk needs Jesus and our future as a church is totally pointless unless we see what God sees to seek heavenly wisdom and clarity, to begin pleading with the Lord, what's next for us? We need you. Our county needs you. Lord, we yield ourselves to your purposes. Use us. We as an eldership will be praying and fasting along with you. We're going to be seeking the Lord for what's next for our church family. We want you to pray and fast and to communicate and interact with us about what's going on throughout May. And then hopefully, God willing, Beyond the month of May, we will find that we are sharpened to our need of grace. Sharpened to the fact that Suffolk needs Jesus. And together, our God-led, gospel-centered future will unfold. Cleaned glasses, so we see what's true. Sharpened knives that have gone blunt. Guitars that need retuning. May we be a people of renewed and focused prayer and fasting. And it's all because of Jesus. Let's pray, and then we'll sing. Father, we want to confess that fasting should have played a a greater feature in the life of our church than it has done. We are sorry for neglecting this important practice in our lives. But Father, we're grateful for the words of the Bible that show us you have given us tools to help us sharpen our spiritual lives, to retune our hearts to sing your grace, to know our need of you, to recognize that we spend way too much of our lives building our hopes on the stuff of this world. But it's Jesus, and it's only ever been Jesus that we need. So, Father, we pray as we look ahead that you would help us to know what's true, 
to come back to our first love, to square one, to know what our souls really need. We are hungry for Jesus. Help us, Lord. We're praying in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Josh. You can stand.
willing, next time we're together, it's all together. About a few miles in that direction. I hope and pray that God uses us in ways that is beyond our imagination. But when I finish this season for the moment with a prayer that thanks God for now and looks forward. Father, we thank you for the 190 year long legacy we get to be a part of. Our church family for the years, it's in generations, it's, it's been here, has seen your faithfulness and we want to see more of the same. So Father, as we step into this new season, be with us, humble us, never let us move from our need of Jesus. And we pray that it would be a new season that is characterized by renewed fasting and prayer. And it's all because of Jesus. And we're praying in his name. Amen. Go in peace, saints.